viewers of my channel will know that I've done a couple videos on the Evil Mad Scientist 555XL and 741XL, the large size discrete components equivalents to the famous 555 timer IC and 741 operational amplifier IC and how I built them into this shadow box display where I had components hooked up and uh, could make them operate. I could turn the 555 on and make it flash an LED showing that it's working. I could turn the 741 on, control the uh, input voltage and watch the output voltage which is roughly twice what the uh, input is. I didn't use very precise resistors in the feedback. These are pretty cool kits and they didn't have them for a while but they seem to have them again. Um, and the subject of this video is a newer product. They now have surface mount versions of these. Here are the two kits the 555SE discrete 555 timer, a totally awesome surface mount soldering kit. Recreate one of the most classic, popular, and all around useful chips of all time, a functional and faithful transistor scale replica of the 555 timer integrated circuit. And the 741SE discrete 741 operational amplifier. Recreate one of the most classic, popular, and all-around useful chips of all time. Let's see what's inside the box. Instructions. All right. Pictorial parts list. Written parts list. Required tools necessary not included with the kit. Solder recommended thin rosin cut core or flux core solder uh, or solder and solder paste. A soldering iron recommended 20 to 50 watt iron with a fine tip. Metal tweezers for handling small components. A small Phillips head screwdriver recommended number one size. Not required but recommended. Extra fine soldering tip. Good to have a magnifier, jeweler's loop, or a microscope. And then it has extra notes. If you have moved beyond soldering irons, in other words, if you use uh, different methods such as hot air rework stations, a skillet, reflow oven, flux, or stencils, make, make use of your skills and equipment as you see fit. And one uh, very well illustrated instructions using the first resistor as an example and then page three and page four which is final assembly circuit theory how to test it out make sure it's working and then a little bit of paper and this is one nice thing about the way they do these kits is all the components are laid out for you machines selected and put in the right order in little numbered bins with the value and step number and then the uh, small circuit board bag of mechanical parts mostly terminals and screws pem nuts which are press-in and solderable nuts for the other screws and then the um, aluminum lead frame which is really just a stand it's non-functional the pins are just there for appearances not for actual electrical use there's the circuit board in more detail the front side very nice I wish it wasn't so glossy. I think it would look better with a matte black finish like the uh, 
larger versions of this kit. Not too much on the back side. Artwork is designed by Eric uh, Schlepfer. I think he's the same guy who designed the uh, the larger versions of the kits. I've got the circuit board held in my pan of ice and I'm going to take out uh, component number two which is a 4.7k resistor and there are several of them here on a strip peeling the top of the uh, carrier tape back I've got the smaller carrier tape actually I'm not sure the bigger thing is really called carrier tape looking through my magnifier it's really kinda hard to see it through there with the camera but um, I've got the tiny little blob of solder at the position R1 on one of the pads there's the component it's upside down uh, at least the writing is 472 which means 47 followed by two zeros or 4700 ohms or 4.7 K and there's the first part soldered to the circuit board okay all seven of the 4.7 K resistors have been soldered I wish I could give a closer view but camera doesn't like focusing any closer than that. There's one, there's two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Okay, all resistors are down on the board. Okay, all the resistors are on the board, so now for the first half of the transistors, and there's a lot of them, these are the uh, 2N3904 NPN bipolar transistors. What other? Uh, seven. Looks like 14 of them. There are the first seven pulled out of their carrier strip. Okay, there's the first transistor, pretty small part. Okay, all the transistors NPN and PNP are soldered to the board now. And I should note that one spare of each of the two kinds of transistors are provided. 13 of each type are required. 14 are provided, so of the 3904 and the 3906, there's one spare each. Okay, now we have to put in the surface mount nuts. So this is the surface mount nut here, and that gets put on upside down, kind of set into the hole, and then soldered all the way around on the large pad. Okay, there's the board with all the soldering completed. Um, I The um, solder and flux I used for the surface mount parts is water soluble, so I washed that off with water, but I used a regular 6040 uh, rosin core uh, solder for the large lugs, and for those I had to use a, uh, a more aggressive flux remover to get that off. I didn't spray the whole board, I just used it on Q-tips to wipe around there and I think I got it pretty well cleared. Here are the remaining hardware parts. The knurled thumb screws, one red, one black, and uh, six gray, light gray, and then four nylon washers and four uh, Phillips screws. 
and the four nylon washers are laid on the uh, lead frame and the four screws have been put through here they go through the nylon washers and they don't appear to be tapped holes I think these sort of self tap into the undersized holes in the aluminum lead frame all right there's the finished product Alright, I have the 555 wired up with a couple of wire jumpers between pins and a couple of 100K resistors connected like that. A 1 microfarad electrolytic capacitor connected on one side there and then through a jumper back to pin 1 which is also ground and an LED and a resistor in series between uh, pin 3 output and ground and I have it connected up to a 5 volt power supply or a 9 volt power supply let's see what happens it's working a functioning 555 circuit alright here's the circuit I'm using for testing it's a classic 555 A stable multi vibrator circuit. Uh, we're using all but one of the pins on the 555. We're not using the uh, voltage control or control voltage uh, pin, which would be uh, pin 5. Don't need to use it in this situation. We have uh, V, plus, which in my test was 9 volts connected from there to ground down here we have the V plus applied to the V plus pin of the 555 that provides it power and then um, pin 1 ground going to circuit ground there's also a reset for the internal flip-flop which we want to disable so it's pulled high by tying it to V plus and then for the uh, the basic circuit um, we have a resistor called R1 here connected from V plus to the discharge pin that's essentially an output it's uh, has a open collector transistor going from here to ground so this is able to be switched on and off internally and it provides essentially a short circuit from here to ground uh, and then we have another resistor, we're calling it R2, going from the discharge pin to the threshold pin. This is an input, which is internally compared to a voltage of two-thirds of V+. plus, So six volts in this case with the nine-volt power supply. We also have that same point tied to pin 2, which is the trigger input, and that's internally compared to a reference voltage that's one third of V plus or three volts in this case and then we have a uh, capacitor we're calling it C going from that point to circuit common that'll get it oscillating but to see what it's doing we need to have a an LED and the output um, drives out here goes through a current limiting resistor of 1k in this instance through the LED into ground so when the output is turned on the LED will be on now what's actually happening inside of here uh, in this configuration the capacitor is going to be charged and discharged charged and discharged charged and discharged over and over and over again it's going to be charged and discharged between a point one third of V plus and a point two thirds of V plus and remember that the uh, two thirds V plus is associated with the threshold input and the one third V plus is associated with the trigger input so let's say we start charging this capacitor through these two resistors so those determine how long it takes to charge up or what rate it's charging up.
it's non-linear when you charge a capacitor through just a resistance it isn't charging up with a linear voltage which is why I drew these with a bit of a curve to them but eventually it gets up to the point where this point at the top of the capacitor gets to be bigger than two-thirds of V plus and that changes the uh, 555 into discharge mode there's an internal flip-flop which flips and then it doesn't matter what the voltage here does uh, initially it's going to remain in that state of the flip-flop and that turns on the discharge pin so now that's connected internally to ground and instead of uh, trying to charge the capacitor through both these resistors it's trying to discharge this capacitor through this resistor to ground this resistor doesn't do anything because remember this is at ground so it's just from the power supply to ground and it doesn't affect the charging or discharging of the um, capacitor and then the voltage on the capacitor starts falling as we're discharging it and it keeps doing that until we drop below the one-third voltage or one-third V plus voltage and that's sensed by the trigger input when it goes below that threshold then it kicks the internal flip-flop back into charging mode and the discharge pin is internally disconnected from ground so it's out of the picture and now you're charging the capacitor again through both resistors and that repeats uh, so uh, the output is turned on during charging and therefore you get a rectangular wave it's really hard to get a symmetrical uh, waveform in other words 50 percent on 50 percent off you can't quite get there because the uh, two resistors are always involved in charging but only one resistor is involved with discharging uh, so it, it discharges uh, with a smaller resistance than it charges with therefore it discharges quicker and that causes the asymmetrical output uh, it is possible to make a 555A stable have a 50% duty cycle but you have to add extra components with just this basic simple arrangement the output will always be somewhat asymmetrical uh, anyway if you just care about generating a frequency with a rectangular wave output this circuit will do it and certainly it's good enough for flashing an LED if you don't care about it being precisely 50 percent on and off the frequency can be calculated from this formula where frequency is equal to 1.44 divided by R1 plus 2 times R2 and then that whole thing multiplied by the capacitance and then you take all that and divide 1.44 by that number and with the uh, R1 and R2 both being 10k in this test circuit and the capacitor being 1 microfarad the frequency of oscillation is roughly 4.8 Hertz which is pretty much what uh, was observed of course uh, with this basic building block a huge variety of different circuits can be uh, created the chip is laid out in such a flexible way that it's almost limitless the things you can do with it and the ways in which it can be used and that is really the reason why the 555 endures as probably the most popular IC of all time all right now for the 741 SE should be pretty similar to the 555 similar kind of instructions similar piece of newspaper similar um, surface mount chip carrier Hem nuts, bag of hardware, circuit board, and lead frame. Okay, circuit board front looks of a similar complexity to the 555. 
not much on the back. I don't know if this is a multi-layer board or not. Might not need to be. All right, got it all clamped up and ready to go. One of the few good things about building hand-build kits with surface mount parts, in my humble opinion, is that at least you don't have to flip the board over to solder and clip leads. But I really do still pref prefer through hole for things I build. All right, all of the resistors are on the board. And there's the one and only capacitor right there. A 33 picofarad part. And then the two diodes. Alright, now we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. We have 14, count them 14, transistors of the uh, 2N3904 type. These are NPN general purpose bipolar transistors. Now this is actually the MMBT3904, meaning the uh, particular surface mount package. If it was in a normal um, through-hole arrangement, it would just be a 2N 3904, but electrically the same. All right, all of the 3904 transistors are soldered to the board. And now all the PNP transistors, the 3906s, have been soldered. Um, I had actually forgotten one of the NPN transistors on the previous step. Uh, the way it was listed in the instructions made it look like they were just jumping over Q6, but in fact they were including it. So I've gone back and put that one on. There was one spare NPN transistor and no spare transistors for the PNPs. All right, all the PEM nuts or surface mount nuts. Um, actually, I don't think they are PEM nuts. PEM nuts would be swaged, and these are just soldered, so they're on there anyhow. All right, there it is completed with the thumb screws in and the circuit board mounted to the uh, lead frame in the same way it was done for the 555 SE. Alright, here's a test. I have the 741 set up in a non-inverting amplifier configuration with a gain of 2, so whatever comes in the input should be doubled at the output. I have a potentiometer connected between V plus and V minus, and currently set as close as I can to 0 volts at the wiper, and that's applied directly to the input of the 741. I have a voltmeter tied to the um, output, and I'm applying plus and minus 9 volts. Actually, I think I really need to get two meters on this, don't I? All right, I have another meter on it now. I'm getting about uh, 10 millivolts on the input and about 20 millivolts on the output. In other words, 0 0.01 volts input, 0 0.02 volts output. And if I crank the input up to, let's say, about one volt, close as I can get it, the output is really close to two volts. This is more due to the tolerance of the input and feedback resistors that I have than anything to do with the op amp itself. So let's go up to about three volts. And we're about 6 volts on the output, looking good. Let's crank it down to minus 3 volts. Yeah, about minus 3 volts, and I've got a about minus 1.5 on the input. Let's take it down to about 
minus 8 volts I can't go any lower than that because of the rail of the 741 so let's make it minus uh, 7 volts Okay, about minus 7 and we're about minus 3.5 on the input so this 741 SE is working just fine alright let's look at the circuit this is a classic non-inverting op amp amplifier here's the 741 and it would be even more classic if I drew in the minus input sign. So the uh, input voltage is applied directly to the plus input. It's very high impedance. In an application like this it does not need any additional stuff out here unless you were going to connect it to the real world in which case you might want to put some protection on it so it can't overrange and damage the part but in a controlled laboratory situation like this it doesn't need anything just apply the input the V output is taken off the output of the op amp and there needs to be feedback on the amplifier so there's a resistor going from the output to the inverting input or the minus input that happens to be a 10k I'm calling it R2 and then to make it a non-inverting amplifier we have to connect the minus input or the inverting input to circuit ground through in this case another 10k resistor uh, which I'm calling R1 remember that an op amp uh, always wants to try to make its inputs equal and uh, so if you put one volt here for example this output here is divided in half by these two 10k resistors so in order to get a 1 volt here to correspond with the 1 volt here you would need to have twice that at the output so an output of 2 volts divided in half by these two equal value resistors would give you 1 volt here that would match the input and the op amp would be happy if on the other hand the output or the the voltage here is a little too high then it will lower the output until it sees one volt here if this is a little too low it will increase the output voltage until it once again sees one volt here matching the input and the same thing happens oppositely if you have a negative voltage here um, but that's the essence of a non-inverting amplifier using an op amp and here's the gain formula gain equals one plus R2 divided by R1, R2 divided by R1. Since these are both 10K resistors, it really is 1 plus 10K divided by 10K. Something divided by another thing of the same value equals 1, so this equation simplifies to 1 plus 1, which of course is 2, so the gain is 2. It'll double whatever is on the input at the output. Now the manual for the kit actually shows an even simpler circuit to test it out that is the same thing I did here with the amplifier connected with its V plus and V minus here they're suggesting plus and minus 15 volts and uh, the input is still applied directly to the non-inverting input or the plus input the output is still taken directly off the output of the op amp but instead of a resistor voltage divider between the output and the inverting or minus input it's just a direct connection so once again let's say you put one volt here the op amp is going to adjust its output until there's one volt here and since there's no voltage divider to change the output value the input here is going to be the same therefore it's going to be one volt and one volt and one volt all the way around or whatever voltage you put on there is going to be equal here here and here and when it's done this way with no components surrounding the op amp it's known as a buffer because whatever signal is on the input is duplicated at the output and of course the reason you have a buffer is when you have a high impedance source and you have to drive a low impedance circuit with it you put a buffer in between so the voltage from the high impedance circuit drives the low impedance circuit but the 
the low impedance out here does not affect the high impedance here therefore it does not skew the input by the loading of the output this is very common so another configuration alright there they both are complete and ready for display or whatever I choose to do with them